going to start recording. And then let's uh, go ahead and check out chapter 19 here on the heart. So some good stuff here. So just a quick review, because back in chapter 10, all right, we talked about the different uh, muscle types. And so obviously this chapter, we're going to be focusing on cardiac muscle since we're dealing with the heart. And so this is one of three types of different muscles that exist in your body. And as you recall, skeletal muscle was long, multinucleated, whereas cardiac muscle is going to be short and it will branch. Tell folks it looks like a Y on its side here. Right? And so it can be multinucleated. It's normally gonna have one or two nuclei. So what we'll see in this cardiac muscle tissue, and of course the location of it is going to be in the, the myocardium, which is the middle layer of the heart, all right? Makes up the majority of the heart wall. And then just internal to that, we're gonna have a nice layer of areolar, all right? Connective tissue, okay? And uh, excuse me, not internal to that, but on the outside, we'll have areolar connective tissue. We refer to that as the endomyosin. Then, of course, similar to skeletal muscle tissue, we've got our sarcolemma, right? That's what we call the plasma membrane for muscle tissue. And we're going to revisit our T tubules. You remember those T tubules were just where the plasma membrane, the sarcolemma, invaginates down into, all right, these tubes. So, pretty much here is the sarcolemma. And then it just invaginates down. And our action potential will carry on down into that and will go into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And if you recall, the sarcoplasmic reticulum is what is going to hold on to our calcium stores. So the sarcoplasmic reticulum is going to cover right, those myofilaments. You remember the myofilaments? Those are those structures, those really tiny structures that are going to be composed of sarcomeres from end to end. And so sarcomeres, as you recall, are striated. They have striated appearance. That's what gives um, skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle the striated period, uh, appearance because we have these alternating light and dark areas. And that's dependent on the amount of overlap that is occurring between the actin and myosin, all right, contractile filaments there. So ideally, we covered this just briefly, I know in chapter 10, when we're talking about how to effectively cause a muscle contraction, you want to have maximum overlap of these filaments, meaning you don't want too much overlap because then you really can't con contract very far. And, you, you, and conversely, you don't want to have hardly any overlap, right, because then you're minimizing the cross bridge cycling, you won't get as strong of a contraction. So basically, it's like the Goldilocks effect. You want it right in the middle. So we have that maximum overlap of those filaments. So this occurs, okay, when the blood is filling the heart chamber there, which is convenient because that's a natural phenomenon. So as the blood starts to fill that chamber, it's going to, as its volume is expanding, it's going to achieve this maximum overlap, which gives us the optimal length. So when the contraction occurs, we are going to get a greater force of contraction. And therefore, if we get a greater force of contraction, we're going to be able to pump more blood. And that's what we want. We want to pump as, uh, um, an adequate amount of blood I shouldn't say adequate, the appropriate amount of blood, depending on what conditions, all right, that the body, the body and the tissues are undergoing, all right, and to do so, we don't want to be wasting a lot of energy on this. So this phenomenon allows that to happen. So a couple of other things that we do need to uh, look at here when we are discussing, all right, the cardiac muscle cells, you probably remember those intercalated discs. And these discs occur, all right, between cells. And they're made up of two structures. Desmosomes, which are actually going to hold the cells together, okay, 
in addition to other intracellular junctions, right? But they will help hold the cells together much more effectively. So when the heart is contracting, okay, we get a much more effective and efficient contraction. So they do so by increasing the stability of those cells in the myocardium. And then the gap junctions, which are made up of proteins, all right, essentially make a hole, right? That will uh, allow one cell to communicate to the other by allowing ions to flow, all right, through those cells. And the, that allows, all right, for each chamber of the heart, which we'll discuss here, okay, you have four chambers, the top two chambers are the atria, the bottom two chambers are the ventricles. So that allows these ions to flow. And as you know, ion movement is important when we're trying to get electrical activity to occur in conductive cells. Muscle cells, neurons are conductive cells. So these gap junctions allow each chamber to function as one unit. So we call that functional syncytium, important to know. And it just optimizes the communication between these cells. So all these cells are contracting at the appropriate time and they're contracting on time as a functional unit. And that's important. So here you can see, okay, our intercalated discs with the desmosomes and the gap junctions. And we'll zoom in here, okay? So at the center of these gap junctions, you have the holes there. And that's what allows the ions to travel from one cell to the next. And then you can see our desmosomes here and they're gonna hold the cells together, all right, much more effectively. So they're adding structural stability. So as we look here, all right, you can see here's our sarcolemma with our T tubule invaginations that are going to allow the actual potential to move down into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And again, the sarcoplasmic reticulum is where we're storing calcium. Now we're going to learn another phenomenon about calcium with cardiac muscle, but I'll get I'll I'll address that here in a moment. Okay, whoops, let me go back. All right, and then you can see here's that endomyosin, that's that areolar connective tissue, all right, on the outside of the cell there. All right, so kind of a quick review here. Here's your sarcomere. All right, that is our one functional unit where we're going to see the overlapping of our actin and myosin, all right, protein filaments. Our sarcomeres have themselves covered here by the sarcoplasmic reticulum. That's where we'll have a lot of our calcium here, all right? Here's your T-tubules. Then, of course, I won't review, um, get into the Z-discs and the H-zone and all that fun stuff. You probably remember that, all right, from uh, chapter 10. All right, but again, these are the different parts or areas of our sarcomere. And in some of these areas, we'll have thick and thin filament overlap. In some areas, you'll only have one or the other, okay? So if you want to review that, just go ahead and check out chapter 10, and it'll give you all that information there. All right, so let's talk about how we supply energy for our muscle tissue, okay? The metabolism here, obviously. Our heart is pumping 24 seven all the time. At rest, it doesn't pump as hard. When you're exercising or under stress, it'll pump a little bit harder. So in doing so, we have to always assume, all right, that the heart has a high demand for energy. So because of that phenomenon, we have to be highly vascularized. So cardiac muscle does so, okay? Has quite a bit of, of, of blood vessels that travel too. It has several mitochondria, if you recall, the mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell. They make the ATP. We need that ATP. And also in cardiac muscle, you're going to see some proteins, myoglobulin, and then creatine kinase. The myoglobulin is the muscle's version of hemoglobin. It's the oxygen-carrying protein that's found in muscle tissue. Creatine kinase all right, is going to be an enzyme that is going to help us regenerate ATP. If you recall, all right, we're going to convert ATP into ADP that will release energy for us. Well, we want to recycle that ADP back into ATP 
as quickly as possible. And creatine kinase helps us do that because it will take a phosphate molecule off of creatinine and then add it onto the ATP molecule. Again, if you want to review that, that's back in chapter 10. So, of course, energy means we need fuel. And so several of the few sor fuel sources are listed below here. Fatty acids, wonderful, wonderful, all right, fuel source. Okay, you get your most bang for your buck, buck from fatty acids. So the heart will use fatty acids, glucose, lactic acid. Now you might um, be wondering, well, wait, lactic acid, isn't that a byproduct of aerobic, or excuse me, anaerobic exercise? Yes. And so in later chapters, we'll learn how lactic acid can be converted into a fuel source. Amino acids, same thing, okay? Through gluconeogenesis, we can convert amino acids into glucose. The liver loves to do that. And of course, ketone bodies, right? Again, we will use non-carbohydrate sources to create glucose so we can use it for energy. And we'll hit that later on in the course. But pretty much your heart heavily relies on aerobic metabolism. What does that mean? We need oxygen. Okay, because if we have oxygen, then we can utilize the mitochondria. If we don't have oxygen, we got a problem. Can't utilize the mitochondria and our ATP production is gonna suck, right? We can only generate two ATP per glucose molecules, but if we have oxygen, we can generate 32. Big difference. So if we don't have oxygen, then we are going to enter into an ischemic state, which means when oxygen is low, right, your muscle cells will start to burn through their fuel sources and the cells of the myocardium will start to die. And a huge part of that is when it cannot get the proper amount of blood flow. You've heard of bypass surgeries and whatnot. People will get blockages in their coronary arteries and so they're compromising, all right, their nutrient supply, their fuel source from the blood. And so if they can't get the oxygen from the blood, it's going to burn through its fuel sources fast and those cells will start to die. And that becomes a problem. All right. So how does the heart work? How do we get this thing to pump? Well, we need an electrical system, just like if you have a sump pump in your basement or the fuel pump in your car, okay? That operates on an electrical system. So your heart has a conduction system that is going to allow, all right, the transmission or the conduction of electrical signals or events, all right, to cross over the heart tissue at the appropriate time so the heart can properly function. And this conduction system allows for that. It allows for the correct timing of contraction of the heart. So we will have, and we're going to learn about these cells here, but we have some specialized cardiac muscle cells, right, that will generate these electrical events, these action potentials. But important to know, they do not, they do not contract. Okay, they are non-contractile cells. All right, so our conduction system is going to be largely influenced by the autonomic nervous system. And you remember that from chapter 15 and chapter uh, 14, okay? The autonomic nervous system, sympathetic versus the parasympathetic, okay? One speeds up the heart, the other one slows down the heart. So we're going to talk about some of that. So let's dissect the conduction system and go through the different parts. The first part is the SA note or the sinal atrial node. This is what initiates your heartbeat. So we nickname it the pacemaker. This is located in the right atrium, okay, on the posterior wall. Okay, so it starts off, all right, the heartbeat starts off here at the SA node. Then it's going to discharge and, um, allow action potentials to spread all the way out, like throwing a stone 
into a wa body of water, how the, the, the ripples just spread out. That's what happens here. And so located close by in the floor of the right atrium is our next structure called the AV node, stands for atrioventricular node, right? It is close to your right atrioventricular valve. That's the valve that separates or that's found in between um, the right atria and the right ventricle. So it's located nearby. So that's the next structure. Then what we're going to see, okay, from the AV node, we're going to have, all right, the AV or the atrial ventricular bundle, also known as the bundle of His, not His, but His. And it's these structures, the neurological structures that come off the AV node that travel down through the interventricular septum here. So they're going to carry that electrical signal down through there. And then when we get down to the apex of the heart, the bottom part of the heart, right, the a bundle of hiss is going to divide into, well, I misspoke, I misspoke, excuse me, not yet, not yet. As we're moving down through the atrial ventricular septum, right, the bundle of hiss will divide into left and right bundles. And then when we get down to the apex there, the bottom of the heart there, then those right and left bundles are going to move up through all right, the walls of the ventricle. And I'll show you what I mean by all that. All right, so this is, we're gonna see all this occur at the uh, um, heart's apex there. Not to worry, I'll show you a picture and here is that awesome picture. All right, so here you can see, here's our SA node, the pacemaker. It's gonna discharge, it's gonna spread action potentials all around, all right? Those action potentials will reach the atrial ventricular node, okay? And that will uh, cause the atrial ventricular node to actually create its own electrical impulses, which will travel down through the AV bundle, okay, into the interventricular septum here. The AV bundle will separate into our right and left bundles. Once they get down here, right, at the apex, they'll start to travel back up through the various walls here of the ventricles. And at that point, okay, those structures are referred to as the Purkinje fibers. And right, so we're going to talk about, you know, the, uh, what all this means, but I just want you to understand the anatomy here. So we start here with the initiation of our action potentials, which will then trigger the activation of this structure, which will then will carry our signal down through the AV bundle. It'll split off in the interventricular septum into the right and left bundles. We get down to the apex, then those right and left bundles will move superiorly back up through the walls of the ventricles. They are known as the Purkinje fibers. All right, we're going to come back and visit that in a little bit because we're going to start to break down how the heart actually beats. And I am going to send out uh, a video. Trust me, I don't like to have you guys watch long videos because my videos are long enough. But I'll send you a nice video that I like to use, about a five-minute video about how the heart, the, the heart cycle, what happens. After this chapter, you should have a pretty good understanding of how the heart cycle works, how blood moves throughout the heart, and this video will help with that. All right, so how do we innervate the heart? Okay, now we're going to go up to the central nervous system and talk about how the central nervous system is going to innervate the heart to get all right, the heart rate to increase or decrease or whatnot. So we're going to start off in the cardiac center. If you recall, we learned that the cardiac center is located in the medulla oblongata. Okay, which is the third part, the inferior most part of your brainstem here. And so you have two parts to the cardiac center. You have the part that speeds up the heart rate, cardio acceleratory center, and then you have the part that will slow it down, cardio inhibitory center. So of course, you know that when we're talking about the control mechanism of homeostasis, how you have a receptor control center and then an effector, right? We have, we're gonna start off by talking about the receptors right? How does your heart know when it's time to speed up or when it's time to slow down, all right? Well, we have receptors for that. Those receptors, the two types of receptors, all right, that we're going to discuss are the baroreceptors and the chemoreceptors. You recall what both of those do. The baroreceptors sense pressure. Chemoreceptors sense the chemical makeup 
of substances in a dissolved fluid, hence the blood? Is there too much carbon dioxide in the blood or not enough oxygen in the blood, baroreceptors? Is your blood pressure, is there just too much pressure on the blood vessel walls or the heart walls, or is there too little? So how does this work? Okay, signals are gonna be sent from the cardiac center, all right, either through the sympathetic pathways or the parasympathetic pathways. We learned all about that in 210, which is good, okay? So an important note on this, and we'll get into the details on how those work. Don't worry about that. I'll revisit that in a second is that the cardiac center does not initiate cardiac activity. It does not. The SA node does that, okay? So if I were to cut all the nerves to your heart, your heart's still gonna beat, right? It's still gonna beat because the SA node is going to be stimulating it to do that. But the cardiac center regulates, okay? Make sure that your heart doesn't beat 500 times a minute, which is impossible. Right, or it only beats once a minute, okay? So the cardiac center is going to influence two things. This is important. One, the rate that which your heart contracts, how fast or how slow, and also the force of those contractions. You need to know those two things, okay? It's either gonna contract really hard or not too hard, or somewhere in the middle there, right? It's gonna modify all that. Right, so it modifies the cardiac activity, but it does not initiate that. I can't stress that enough. So this is one of my favorite slides because there's just so much information on this. I want to stay on it for a bit, but I can't, okay? But if you recall, okay, from previous chapters, right, when we're dealing with the innervation of the heart, the parasympathetic nervous system decreases the heart rate only. That's it. All right, so it, if your heart rate's at 80 and your parasympathetic nervous system kicks in, it'll drop it down below 80, okay? That's it. So of course, it's going to start in the cardio inhibitory center. And of course, if you recall, there were four cranial nerves, right? That played a role in the parasympathetic nervous system. Or cranial nerve three, cranial nerve seven, cranial nerve nine, and then of course, cranial nerve 10, vagus. So vagus, is going to play a role here in the parasympathetic nervous system. And so you have a left and a right vagus nerve. The right vagus nerve is gonna innervate the SA node. And then the left vagus nerve is gonna innervate the AV node. Know that, learn that, memorize that. Important. Okay, not too bad, right? So what about the sympathetic nervous system? Guess what? It also is going to regulate your heart rate, but it'll increase the heart rate, but it does one more thing. It's also going to influence by increasing the force of contraction. That's a great true false question if I ever saw one, comparing the parasympathetic to the sympathetic nervous system, right? Don't be fooled. Parasympathetic only has to do with decreasing the heart rate, it has nothing to do with the force of contraction. Whereas the sympathetic nervous system increases the heart rate, and it also increases the force of contraction. All right, so this is going to be located in the cardioaccelatory center. And then the neurons, all right, are going to come off of T1 through T5 in your spinal cord. T1 through T5. And this is partially this setup here, T1 through T5, why you will sometimes when people are complaining of a heart attack, that they get left chest pain, left arm pain. It's because those same segments of the spinal cord share sensory nervous information from the dermatomes of your chest and the left arm. Whoa, that's coming back, way back from uh, near the end of Bio 210, right? When we talked about referred visceral pain. All right, so these neurons are also going to travel to both the SA node and the AV node. But not only that, they're not going to stop there. They're going to go to the myocardium, okay, your cardiac muscle tissue and coronary arteries, something you may have forgotten. And I'll remind you that the sympathetic nervous system is the only part of the autonomic nervous system to influence the diameter 
of your blood vessels. I, mean, we call, I don't know if you recall basomotor tone, that term, okay? Only the sympathetic nervous system will control vasoconstriction or vasodilation of blood vessels, okay? So that's what we're gonna talk here because those sympathetic neurons are going to cause dilation, vasodilation in the coronary arteries. I hope that some of this is familiar or it's kind of shaking some of the cobwebs off. Like, oh yeah, I remember that. I remember that. So this picture basically is just showing you everything that I just talked about. Let's start off here with the receptors, okay? So you have receptors located in various blood vessels, okay? The baroreceptors and the chemoreceptors are found in the carotid bodies of your common carotid artery just before it uh, branches off into the external and internal carotids. Again, you'll learn about that when we get to the circulatory system. And then you also have some of these receptors in the arch of the aorta, and you'll also have some, all right, in the right atrium. So you have receptors in these locations. Again, they're going to be monitoring how much pressure are on the, the walls of these structures, and they'll also be monitoring the makeup of the dissolved um, chemicals in the blood, namely how much carbon dioxide or how little carbon dioxide or how much oxygen, how little. Right, so it's going to be monitoring all that information. And so it's going to send that information up to our control center here in the medulla oblongata, the cardiac center. Okay. And depending on what's going on, okay, if, you're, if your blood pressure is falling, if it's decreasing, right, then we want to increase the blood pressure. How do we do that? All right, a couple of different things, but one of the ways we can do that is increase the heart rate. So what we'll do, we are going to then send, all right. Our sympathetic nervous system is then going to send information down through those spinal cord segments of T1 through T5 to the various structures in the heart, SA node, AV node, through the myocardium, okay, and through the coronary arteries here. All of that to help increase, all right, our blood pressure, right, by contracting the heart more, for example. Or if your heart rate is too, or excuse me, if your blood pressure is too high, no problem. All right, same type of scenario. The receptors pick up that information, relay it to the cardiac center. Then we're going to activate the cardio inhibitory center. Cardio inhibitory center is part of the parasympathetic nervous system. All right, and then it will activate via the right and left vagus nerves to slow down the heart rate by slowing down the actual potential discharge in the SA node and the AV node. All right, I'll get into more detail about that. Okay. So let's talk about how we stimulate our heart, okay? There's two events when we're talking about contraction, right? We just talked about the conduction system. That is what is going to initiate the contraction of the heart. It's going to initiate that, that whole process there, right? So it initiates the act potential, and then it keeps it alive. We call that propagation. So it propagates the action potential, All right? Then... What we're going to see, right, these action potentials are going to travel throughout the heart tissue. And then we have our cardiac muscle cells, remember them, right? So they are also going to fire action potentials, right? But these cells will contract. And that's going to pump the blood. So we see this stimulation. And, and again, I got to remember to send that video out to you. It really shows you how the heart contracts. Right, the atria muscles uh, will contract first, and then right after they contract, the ventricles will contract. Okay, so it's a it's a top down phenomena. Atria contract first, then the ventricles contract, and it's really neat to see how the ventricles contract because they the atria will kind of contract from the top of the atria down to the bottom of the atria, which makes sense because the ventricles are below. So they'll push the blood from the atria down into the ventricles. But then, okay, the ventricles will contract from the bottom upwards. So they'll push the blood from the bottom as it's gathered there and pooled there up and out of the ventricles into, all right, your um, arteries and veins there. I got a question. No, it's not the crash course one, I, um, but uh, I don't know how long that video is. 
uh, this other one, I'll have to find it. And, and I've tried to show that video when I'm doing these things, but the volume never works. I think there's a problem with my computer. I have to mess around with it. Um, but it's just a cool looking uh, 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 model uh, or uh, computer uh, depiction. I think, I think you'll enjoy it. All right, so let's look at our conduction system. And I wanna introduce to you now a, a new player in the game. Okay, when we're talking about the heart contracting in our conduction system, I want to talk about the nodal cell. Okay, this is that non-contractile cell I was telling you about. And this is the cell, all right, that is going to, in the SA node, initiate our action potential. So it's going to start the process. And again, like I said, when these cells, all right, discharge the electrical act event, all right, when they initiate that action potential, it spreads out everywhere, okay? Like throwing a rock, right, into a nice calm body of water. It just spreads all the way out. And so it will spread out and eventually, okay, as it spreads out, it'll be propagated and then it'll find its way to our AV node. And then that will carry that signal down into the ventricle. We'll, we'll walk through that, okay? So we're gonna start off with our, our nodal cell. And then of course, we can't ignore our cardiac muscle cells. These are the ones that make the magic happen. Right? They will also propagate the action potentials, right? But of course, they're gonna be the one that contracts. And, we, and the nice thing about this chapter is we already understand how that whole system works. I'll review some of the concepts here, all right? But we are going to have our sarcomeres shorten, all right? Because of that action potential. So we'll have the cross bridge cycling going on and all that. And as the sarcomeres shorten, the cardiac muscle cells will contract. And then we will actually be causing the movement of blood through the heart, through our circulatory system. So let's start off talking about our nodal cells. All right, so like we did with the neurons in chapter 12, and we talked about um, how to describe what a neuron, their physiology, we're gonna start off by describing it to you at rest. We're gonna do the same thing here with our nodal cells. Let's talk about what's going on with them at rest, okay? Don't forget, these are the cells that initiate the heartbeat. I can't repeat that enough. And they do so, okay, by the phenomenon of spontaneous depolarization, which means they don't need to be told to depolarize. They just do. That's just what they do. They just keep depolarizing, okay? So that's why it's important, all right, for these cells to be able to get a constant supply of nutrients, of ATP, all right? That's why blood flow is so important to the heart. All right, so these nodal cells are going to depolarize and they're going to create that action potential. So the resting membrane potential for nodal cells is negative 60. Remember, negative 70 was the resting membrane potentials for neurons. Okay, these are negative 60. All right, so similar makeup to some of the other conductive cells that we've learned about in this course. All right, we're going to see in these cells sodium potassium ion pumps. They are largely responsible for the membrane potential. Okay, we have calcium pumps. That's kind of new, all right, for this uh, uh, topic here, for these cells. And then of course we have our leak channels. They also play a role in establishing our membrane potential, okay? So we have some new transport proteins that I'd like to talk to you about, all right? Otherwise known as voltage gated channels. And now we give them a special name. And these special names help to describe what they do. So we have slow voltage gated sodium channels, fast voltage gated calcium channels, and then we just have our voltage gated potassium channels. Okay, so it's important now we put those words, those descriptors in front of the titles of these channels to hopefully to help you to understand what is going on here. When you think of slow and fast, all right, obviously they're going to tell you what phenomena is happening quickly and what uh, phenomena is happening not so quickly. Okay, so let's go through and show you a quick picture here. Here's our nodal cell at rest, negative 60 millivolts. 
right? You can see we have our slow voltage gated sodium channel. Then we have our fast voltage gated calcium channel. And then we have our regular voltage gated potassium channels. And I'll go through all this with you. All right, what's gonna happen? All right, same type of concept for those of you that have had me before. Keep in mind, banana floating in the ocean. Okay, the banana is rich in potassium. So potassium will be on the inside of the cell in a large concentration. And then sodium and chloride are gonna be on the outside of the cell in a large concentration. But additionally, now we have a new player here. We've got calcium channels. So we're gonna see a lot of calcium outside of these cells here. All right, and that comes um, into play here really soon. So we'll talk about that in a moment. So let's talk about how we initiate our action potential. All right, so remember what I was telling you, these nodal cells will spontaneously discharge, right? So we call that phenomenon autorhythmicity. And that just means that these cells just keep firing. They don't need to be stimulated by anything. They just keep doing it. It's like rinse, repeat, wa 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 excuse me, wash, rinse, repeat, wash, rinse, repeat. Happens over and over again. So, okay, for this cell to depolarize, of course, there's that famous term threshold. We need to reach a threshold here. So here's what happens. The first part of this phenomenon when we initiate our action potential is the slow voltage gated sodium channels are open. So sodium slowly flows in, right? As that's occurring, right? We start to depolarize the inside of our cell. We go from negative 60 to a less negative value. So we go from negative 60, negative 50 to whatever, till we hit negative 40. And that's our threshold value. Sorry, I hate when that happens. All right, so negative 40. So once that occurs, then the cell has depolarized and then our fast voltage-gated calcium channels open up. And calcium, again, it's a cation. It opens up more calcium on the outside of the cell than on the inside. So we have a difference in the concentration gradient there. And so calcium flows into the cell fast. And so now our membrane potential goes from negative 40 to quickly to zero. And as soon as that happens and boom, those calcium channels will close. No more calcium is coming in. And then of course, our voltage gated channels open up and potassium, did I say, well, yeah, our voltage gated potassium channels open up and potassium flows out. And in doing so, we go back to our resting membrane potential of negative 60. And once we hit negative 60, we repeat. And those slow voltage gated channels open back up again. And this whole process just keeps repeating itself, All right? So learn the order, slow voltage gated channels open up, All right? Once we get to negative 40, our threshold value, all right, they'll close down. The fast voltage gated calcium channels open. Uh, calcium channels open up. Calcium flows in, and then it takes us to negative zero. Excuse me, negative zero takes us to our um, value of negative zero. I keep saying that. I'm sorry. To zero, and then as soon as we hit that value, then the fast calcium channels close, and then our voltage gated potassium channels open up and causes repolarization. Once we get back down to that resting membrane potential, boom, it starts again. So that whole process is just going on and on and on and on and on. All right, so what we've done is, is we've recorded this, all right, and we've paced it. We've seen just how long this takes. And it takes just short of a second. So this roughly, all right, when we look at this, when we talk about our SA node, when we're at rest, uh, this will give us about 75 beats per minute, All right? So here's the issue. We don't see that if we're looking, all right, at this tissue when it's not inside the body, okay? 
So we've taken some heart tissue out, we've cultured it, and we record, right, what the discharge rate is going to be for action potentials. And we found out that it's 100 beats per minute. So what slows us down? Our parasympathetic nervous system slows us down. Our vagus nerve slows us down. That's what prevents our heart from beating at 100 beats per minute. The normal resting heart rate is 80. Okay, there's a range for that though. And you should know this, right? That range is going to be Sixty to one hundred um, beats per minute. That's the range. And then, of course, what we do is take the middle of the range, and that is your normal resting heart rate. That's what we're looking for. So when you're getting your pulse taken, that's kind of where we want you to flow around. Now, if if you want to get lower than sixty, that's fine. Okay, not too low. All right, as long as you're okay. Uh, one of the lowest recorded resting heart rates was, I think it was 27 beats per minute. That was for Miguel Indurain. He was a world-class uh, cyclist. Um, this was back in the 90s, I think, maybe even the 80s. Um, athletes, you'll see their resting heart rate will be a little bit lower. Um, so I know people that have had 42 beats per minute um, as a resting heart rate. Okay. So keep in mind, our parasympathetic is going to slow down those beats from 100 beats to a minute to around 80, 75 beats per minute. And that phenomenon is known as vagal tone, vagal tone. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So here's what we're looking at, okay, when we graph out our nodal cells when they are undergoing, all right, that autorhythmicity. Right, that spontaneous depolarization, that, and this is what it looks like. And you can see on our graph here, right, here's our resting uh, membrane potential, and it's quick. It only stays there for a moment. And then those slow right, voltage-gated sodium channels open up. Sodium starts to flow in. We hit that threshold potential, right, and then boom, calcium starts to just flood into the cell through the uh, fast voltage gated calcium channels, and then that just shoots right up. Okay, we get to that zero thresh, that zero value, and then the, the uh, calcium gates close down, and then potassium then starts to move out of the cell, returning us back down to our resting membrane potential just for a moment, and then those slow voltage gated sodium channels open up again. Same thing, boom. Okay. So that's what we're seeing. So this picture is just kind of showing you, this is a great figure to look at if you're trying to understand. All right, so how do we reach threshold? Okay, we open up those slow voltage gated sodium channels, sodium travels in, moves us to our threshold value. Then when we get to the threshold value, the sodium gated channels close, All right now, all right, that triggers the opening of our fast voltage gated calcium channels. Calcium just floods in, and that takes us to that zero value. And then once we reach that, the calcium channels will close, and we're going to undergo repolarization when the voltage gated potassium channels open up, and potassium can then flow out of the cell, dropping all right our membrane potential all right back down to that resting membrane potential value of negative 60. And when that happens, then the voltage-gated uh, potassium channels close. And then guess what we do? We repeat. And we do this whole process over again. And this is going on and on and on. And that's our spontaneous depolarization of these nodal cells. So I guess you could say they do it to themselves. All right, so now that we know that and we know where these cells are located, okay, well, let's start off and talk about how we spread our action potential. Our action potential is the word. We got to spread the word to the people, to the masses. 
All right, and those masses are our cardiac muscle cells. So our conduction system is going to do that. So it starts off here at the SA node. So the SA node initiates the action potential and it spreads out. Like I said, it spreads throughout the atria and it'll eventually reach the AV node, okay? And as it travels through the AV node, all right, it will then trigger the AV node, okay, to carry the message on. Something that you should know though, okay, and this is why it's incredibly important that you know about these intercalated discs, don't forget about these gap junctions. Remember, it's those intercalated discs, all right, that are made up of those desmosomes and those gap junctions that are going to allow us to facilitate the movement of all those ions that we just saw on the previous page, all right, to move throughout all the cells. So we can get these chambers to contract together. That functional syncytium, okay? You got problems if one atria is contracting at a different time than, one, than the other atria. It's not good. They both do it at the same time, and this is why, okay? So if I go back to this picture here, kind of showing you, wow, it's way back. Okay, you can see how when the SA node is initiating the action potentials, action potentials are going down this way, but they also flow across to the other atria, and they're able to do so quickly because of those gap junctions. It doesn't inhibit the movement of those ions. It actually welcomes the movement of those ions. So both, all right, the right and left atria can contract at the same time, pushing the blood down here into both the ventricles. Okay, so now, all right, the action potential reaches the AV node. And this is important. That action potential is delayed. And we want it to be delayed for a few moments. All right, because if we don't delay the, 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 the spreading of this act potential, the ventricles will contract too soon. We need to fill those ventricles up with blood. So the AV node is like our bottleneck, our stop gap, right? Which is important. We have very few gap junctions by design in this area. So that will slow down the movement of those ions here, giving us that much needed delay. So we can slow things down for a moment. So we can fill up those ventricles. And the only way that those action potentials can actually make their way down into the ventricles is through this pathway. We have insulated all the other areas here, okay, to prevent those action potentials from getting down into the ventricles. So they have to go through this bottleneck here. Because again, we don't want discharging and action potentials and contractions of the ventricle cardiac cells, all right, before we filled those chambers up with blood. That's important that you know that. Okay, so our action potential gets delayed at the AV node, okay? Then what happens once it makes to the AV node and then and onwards, it's gonna travel down through the AV bundle or the bundle of Hiss down through the interventricular septum. Then the AV bundle will split into the right and left bundle branches. And then they'll reach the apex or that pointy part of your heart. And then they, they just go off in their own direction. They just scatter, okay? Because they're gonna scatter and go, and, and go superiorly or travel up all the walls of the ventricles as Purkinje fibers. And that's what allows us to spread, those Purkinje fibers allow us to spread the action potential through the ventricles. And again, we have to thank those gap junctions. Thank you, gap junctions. Thank you for letting those ions flow freely through those cardiac cells, okay? So we can cause the ventricles to contract pretty much at the same time. It's pretty awesome. It's a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, uh, occurrence. And if you think about it, because this is happening, as I'm sitting here talking to you, it'll be happening tonight as you're sleeping. 
It'll be happening when you're taking your next exam. That's what happens. This conduction system rocks. It's awesome. So here, let's take a quick peek in a little bit more detail with pictures, of course. Okay, so here is our pacemaker, SA no discharging, all right, or initiating the action potential, spreading, all right, the action potentials quickly over here to the other atria, all right, and then allowing the action potential to travel down to the AV node, which slows things down, quick delay. So these chambers can contract and push whatever blood is in these chambers down into the ventricles, all right? That short delay then, the action potential can now travel down here through, all right, the atrial ventricular bundle, right? And then as it moves down here into the interventricular septum, it separates, right, into our right and left bundle branches, Whoops. Okay, starts to travel down here. Splits off into the left and right bundle branches, and then eventually makes its way down. That action potential eventually makes its way down to the Purkinje fibers. You can see they're at the bottom, and then they start to move upwards here and here, okay, and even in through here, all over the place, all through the walls of the ventricle. And the ventricles will start to contract from the bottom portion here of the heart and then upwards. And what that will do is it will push the blood from the ventricles into your arteries and veins of the heart. Through the pulmonary trunk, through the aorta. Cool, cool stuff, all right? Even just talking about it, I get all giddy. Okay, so just a couple other things, all right? Some phenomena about Purkinje fibers. They have a larger diameter. What did we say back in chapter 12? We talked about what speeds action potential through neurons. What are some of the qualities that will ensure a quicker uh, transmission of action potentials? One, if those neurons are myelinated, and two, the diameter, larger diameter. Purkinje fibers are larger, all right? So they will allow that action potential to move very fast, very fast. And so because of that, we can get the contraction of the ventricles at the same time. All right, remember, our heart is a pump, okay? And like pumps, you only want whatever you're pumping to go in one direction. So you want to make sure that whatever you're pumping doesn't backflow, all right? Well, you have, all right, your cusps, which are the valve, the leaflets of the valves. These valves ensure the way that they uh, open and close, they ensure that muscle, uh, excuse me, that um, blood only flows in one direction. So you have these muscles in the ventricles, and they're called the papillary muscles. And these papillary muscles will attach onto the valves, specifically the cusps of those valves, through these cord-like structures called chordae tendinae. I always think of it like a parachute, right? You've got your parachute pack attached to the person that's skydiving. And then when they open up their chute, all right, the uh, parachute is attached through these uh, uh, ropes or tethers to the pack that the person is wearing. So the cordae tendinae are going to be those cords, all right, that attach onto the cusps, much like those cords attach onto the actual parachute, right? And so what they do is they prevent the AV valves, the atrial ventricular valves, those are the valves that are in between the atria and the ventricles from opening up. Because when the ventricles are contracting, pressure builds up, and we want the blood to leave the ventricles out through either your pulmonary trunk or your aorta. We don't want them fl the blood flowing back into the ventricles. So these papillary muscles okay, will contract and keep those valves closed. Right? So blood only moves in one area. And like I said before, 
of the stimulation or the beginnings of the um, contraction of the heart occurs at the apex of the heart. So it's a bottom up phenomena. So that contracts first. And it helps to push the blood upwards and out of the arterial trunks. All right, a lot of good information there. Let's talk about our cardiac muscle cells. Let's see what they're doing. All right, so we talked about the nodal cells and our conduction system. How about our cardiac muscle cells? They're just gonna be hanging out. So of course, let's talk about what they're doing when they're just resting, when nothing's happening for a very brief moment. All right, let's talk about some of the pieces involved. All right, sodium, potassium, ion pumps. Again, that's going to help us create this membrane potential here, All right? We're also gonna have calcium pumps because we need to create a concentration gradient of calcium. We're gonna talk about the importance of calcium. We already know why it's important in muscles, right? Because it helps to move the troponin tropomyosin complex off of the actin and myosin so we can actually form a cross bridge. No difference here, All right? But here, right, we have more than one source of calcium. It's not just going to be the calcium that's located in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. We can also get calcium and pull it in from outside of the cell. That's important. And then, of course, our, our leak channels for sodium and potassium, which will also help to contribute to our membrane potential. So our resting membrane potential for our cardiac muscle cells has a value of negative 90. Ooh. Skeletal muscle had the same. Okay, so our resting membrane potential is negative 90. All right, so again, we're gonna include some new players here. We have a, in this time, in this case, we have a fast voltage gated sodium channel and slow voltage gated calcium channels. We're just flip flopping the titles for these transport proteins, right? From the nodal cell to the cardiac muscle cell. All right, and of course, all these channels are closed. That's something we learned way back in chapter four. When the cell is at rest. Our voltage gated channels are closed. So that's what we see here. So here's a nice picture of our different channels, okay? So we have our fast voltage gated channel, our slow voltage gated channel for calcium, and then our voltage gated channel for potassium. Again, notice more calcium outside the cell. So calcium wants to enter into the cell, as does sodium. Both of those are cations. Right, and then we have more potassium inside the cell. So that phenomenon has not changed. All right, so here's our cell at rest, negative 90 millivolts. So let's talk the story through, okay? And, uh, and I kind of feel confident that at this point, you pretty much have an idea of how this is going to occur. Okay, so let's start off with the electrical event, all right, of cardiac muscle cells at rest and then going into depolarization followed by our repolarization. So depolarization, how does that occur, all right? Our impulse rushes in, okay, either from the conduction system itself, which is generating action potentials or from those ions that are flowing through our gap junction. So you have two possible sources here, conduction system or the gap junctions. Regardless, here's what happens. That triggers the opening of our fast voltage gated sodium channels. Fast meaning sodium rushes in like no other. And look at this, it goes from a negative 90 millivolt value to a positive 30 millivolt value. Huge. Once we hit that positive 30, we start to close down these channels. Okay, so we go from negative 90, spring straight up to a positive 30, those channels close down. And then we hit this phenomena called the plateau phase, okay? So again, I'll show you a picture and why we call it the plateau phase, because when we graph this, literally on our graph, it gets relatively flat. So we discharge this, the cardiac muscle cell. Once that occurs, now we're gonna open up our voltage gated potassium channels 
And at the same time, we're gonna open up our voltage gated, slow calcium channels. So if you think about this, calcium is gonna flow into the cell, it's a positive ion, whereas potassium is gonna exit the cell, it's a positive ion. So you have two positive ions going in opposite directions, okay? Two positive ions moving in opposite directions. So we're really not gonna change the membrane potential significantly at this point, okay? So this is important that you know that, right? Potassium leaves the cell as sodium, uh, excuse me, as calcium enters, all right? So our plasma membrane will still remain depolarized. Then we follow that whole event up with repolarization. And with that phenomenon, all right, our voltage gated calcium channels will close, but the potassium channels remain open, bringing us back to that negative 90 millivolts. All right, so this is a little bit different. Cardiac muscle cells are a little bit different. Okay, it starts off great. In fact, it goes gangbusters. Look at this. Look at our electrical event graph here, okay? So here we are, our resting membrane potential of negative 90, okay? And then we start to discharge, all right? Our nodal cells generate that active potential. Ions start flowing through the gap junctions, and boom, that's going to trigger the opening of those fast, voltage-gated sodium channels. So sodium floods into the cell. Look at that. It's virtually vertical, straight up and down. Hardly any time. If you look on our time that's elapsed, all right, when those channels open up, it's hardly any time. And so it shoots up to this positive 30 value. Then those fast voltage-gated sodium channels close. And then both are slow, voltage-gated calcium channels open up and our voltage-gated potassium channels open up. So we get kind of an exchange of those ions across the plasma membrane and it causes us to plateau out, all right? And then eventually the slow voltage-gated calcium channels will close, the uh, voltage-gated sodium or potassium channels remain open. And so then we start to repolarize our cell, boom right back there. So that's what we look at, all right, when we're looking at a cardiac muscle cell, when we graph the electrical events here, that's the phenomenon that you'll see. So in story, uh, storyline mode, let's take a quick peek. Here's our depolarization phase. We go from that negative 90 millivolt resting membrane potential, our fast voltage gated channels uh, open up, Sodium floods in, it brings us to that positive 30 value. Once that occurs, those channels will close. And then both our slow voltage gated calcium channel opens up and then our voltage gated potassium channels open up and we get an exchange across the plasma membrane here. All right, now again, this is a slow channel. So calcium moves slower, all right, than potassium leaving the cell. So then that's our plateau phase. Then what we'll see is those slow voltage gated calcium channels close. And then the only channel that remains open is gonna be the voltage gated potassium channels. And then we go from that positive 30 value back down to our resting membrane potential of negative 90. And once we hit that value, then our voltage gated um, potassium channel will close down. So that's what we're seeing with our transport proteins here or the channels in a cardiac muscle cell. So once we get all of that going on, because again, our, ideally we, we need calcium to get into the cell, right? We need that calcium inside the cell because that's where our sarcomeres are. That's where our myofilaments are. That's where we have the cross bridge cycling occurring. And if you recall, we need to remove the regulatory proteins, troponin, 
tropomyosin, right, blocks, all right, the binding site, all right, that myosin, or excuse me, that actin has for myosin. So we need to remove those proteins. So as calcium enters in from either the sarcoplasmic reticulum or from the interstitial fluid, that's just outside the cell, all right, those are two places that we can get our calcium, that when it enters in, it's going to bind to the troponin and then remove that regulatory protein off of the binding sites. Then we can get our cross bridge cycling. You guys remember that, okay? We form the cross bridge, we get the power stroke, we have to release, all right, the uh, myosin from the actin, then we have to recock or reset the myosin head and then we do the whole thing over again. Then cross bridge formation, power stroke, all right, that whole process will occur, all right? So that's ideally what we're trying to do here. So when we get that calcium entering in through those slow voltage-gated calcium channels, but also we'll get it from the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the cell, okay? So when it's time to relax the cell, we got to get rid of that calcium and pump it out of the cell. How do we do that? We've got our calcium uh, pumps that move it out of the cell so we can decrease our calcium levels so we can then start the whole process over again. All right, an important concept here, if you recall, when we were learning about skeletal muscle, following a muscle contraction, all right, we have a, refract a refractory period, all right? And so that's when we can't really stimulate um, uh, the muscle to contract again, right? And then we talked about the phenomena of tetany, where if we just kept stimulating a, 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 mu a muscle cell, cardiac muscle, excuse me, a, a skeletal muscle cell, we can get it to have a sustained contraction. Well, that's, that's, that's a problem. That's a big problem in the heart. You don't want your heart to be able to sustain a contraction, okay? Because then we can't fill the heart with blood and then pump that blood out. So we cannot have tetany going on in cardiac muscle cells, okay? So in order to prevent tetany from ever occurring, all we're gonna do is we're gonna extend our refractory period, okay? We're gonna make it nice and long. So during that time, in case we do get some action potential, some nerve impulses, right, coming to those uh, cardiac muscle cells, doesn't matter. They're not going to be able to do anything, right, because we have a refractory period going on, which means we cannot, under any circumstances, contract that muscle cell. So our refractory period for cardiac muscle cells is 250 milliseconds seems like a lot, but it's not because it's milliseconds here, right? But that's what we're talking about when we get to that plateau phase. That's why it's important. I'm going to show you here, all right, on this uh, next slide here, why that's important, okay? So again, we do not want to have that sustained tetanic contraction. Not good for the heart. So it gives us a period of contraction followed by a period of relaxation all the time until it's stimulated again, all right? Important that you understand that. Okay, so here we're looking at skeletal muscle cells. This isn't cardiac, but skeletal. So we're basically showing you here, okay? This is a review from chapter 10, okay? What happens here in the blue, all right? We're gonna depolarize and repolarize, but you should see there's a short refractory period here in which we cannot, all right, stimulate our skeletal muscle cell, all right? It's very short. But what we'll see is we can follow it with a muscle contraction followed by muscle relaxation. And so if we keep doing that and stimulating, what we'll see here is this one single muscle contraction, right? We've stimulated again and again and again and again until it's reached tetany. And it's a sustained muscle contraction. That is not good for the heart muscle. This is what we see here. Here's the conduction system here, depolarizing, all right? 
But if you'll notice during that period of time when we contract, when the muscle is stimulated to contract, all right, that happens during the plateau phase. And this does not get any shorter this whole period of time. So we have to wait for this phenomenon to occur before we can stimulate another muscle contraction. And it's because of that plateau phase, everything that occurs during that time, that we have all right, this configuration, all right, contraction, relaxation, contraction, relaxation. All right, so you have a very long refractory period compared to a very short refractory period in skeletal muscle cells. Good concept to know, very, very important here. Oh, I'm so tempted to start with the cardiac cycle. I wrestle with this, but I tell you what, I am going to stop here for this video, okay? And um, I will send out